Welcome to all our panel, our panelists, and welcome to our participants coming into the room. We're just waiting a minute while the event goes live on Facebook and as more participants come in. The number is still climbing, so I'll wait just a few more seconds. I think we're ready to go. So good afternoon from Harvard Law School. Good morning and good evening to our viewers joining from around the world. My name is Hagop Togramajian, and on behalf of the Harvard Law School Advocates for Human Rights, it is my honor to introduce our guests, Gerald Knaus, Casey Michel, and Rasmus Kanbeck. Gerald Knaus is the founding chairman of the European Stability Initiative, an organization on the front lines of advocating rule of law and human rights in Europe. After studying in Oxford, Brussels, and Bologna, Mr. Knaus has taught at universities and worked in civil society across Europe, and served as a longtime fellow right here at Harvard at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Mr. Knaus publishes extensively on migration, the rule of law in Europe, refugee issues, and corruption. Casey Michelle is a writer, analyst, and investigative journalist focused on financial corruption. His recent book, American Kleptocracy, is lauded as fluent, coherent, and entertaining by The Economist, masterful by The Financial Times, and brilliantly clear by The Atlantic. Mr. Michel has written extensively on the way Eurasia's authoritarian regimes are exporting corrupt practices, undermining human rights accountability worldwide. Rasmus Kanbeck is a Swedish journalist and expert on the Caucasus region. Much of his work has been published by the Blank Spot Project, one of Sweden's leading platforms for long form journalism. Mr. Kanbeck's book, Every Day I Die Slowly, on the Nagorno Karabakh conflict, will be published next month. Before we get to our excellent panelists, I would like to say a few words about this topic and why we here at Harvard think it is important to discuss now. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the topic of authoritarian oil rich states engaging in grievous human rights abuses is unfortunately deeply relevant to current events. But while we have seen the West largely unite against Vladimir Putin and his aggressive campaign, contributing billions in aid to Ukraine, and even contemplating cutting off flows of Russian gas, the Western response to an equally authoritarian, equally abusive Eurasian power has been far different. The state of Azerbaijan is among the world's most repressive totalitarian regimes, ranked by Freedom House as the world's 12th least free state, far behind even pariahs such as Russia and Iran. Beyond serially imprisoning, torturing, and even murdering its opponents, Azerbaijan's ruling Aliyev regime also enjoys a stranglehold over the nation's economy, siphoning billions of dollars of state oil revenues into private accounts across the globe. The regime's control is so total that few even blinked when on one memorable recent occasion, state authorities accidentally announced President Aliyev's reelection a day before polls had even opened. Beyond totalitarianism at home, Azerbaijan's Aliyev regime has exported its violence and oppression abroad. From 2012, when an Azerbaijani lieutenant beheaded a fellow student at a NATO training program and returned home to a hero's welcome, to 2016, when Azeri forces tortured and murdered Armenian civilians in the village of Talish. Azerbaijan's behavior was already in plain sight before 2020, when it launched its most unspeakable atrocities to date. Under the cover of a global pandemic, Azerbaijan attacked the indigenous Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh, ethnically cleansing large swaths of territory via relentless shelling of civilian areas, deployment of prohibited cluster munitions, burning villages, and torturing and executing civilians, brazenly broadcasting horrific videos of these crimes on social media. Azerbaijan continues to hold prisoners of war and an open violation of the Third Geneva Convention. 
According to Human Rights Watch, these prisoners have been subjected to abhorrent war crimes and at least 19 have died in captivity. In the territory it ethnically cleansed, Azerbaijan has continued what experts have called the worst cultural genocide of the 21st century, openly destroying churches, Christian cemeteries, and religious shrines in a campaign designed to completely erase any trace of Armenian presence from the region. There's much more to say, from Azerbaijan's trafficking of foreign mercenaries, its recruitment of avowed terrorists, to Perhaps important to mention since this week is Earth Day, it's use of chemical weapons to destroy forests on Armenian territory. But without further ado, I would like to welcome our first panelist, Mr. Knaus, to share his opening remarks. Well, thanks a lot and uh, good evening here from Berlin. And I would like to uh, tell a story, and it really is only that a story of how the uh, independent small uh, think tank that I lead based in Berlin stumbled across the story of caviar diplomacy, which raises profound questions about the stability of the and credibility of the institutions that we need to maintain the standards of human rights that have developed in Europe post 1945. The issue is corruption as a strategy. And uh, wait, Back. And uh, what I will describe is an almost perfect crime. It all started, this particular story, in 2001, which was the year in which Azerbaijan joined the oldest human rights institution in Europe, the Council of Europe. Ilham Aliyev became a vice president of the parliamentary assembly of that institution before becoming president, the successor to his father, two years later. Azerbaijan set its sights on the institution that Ilham Aliyev was member when he and his country joined in 2001, the Parliamentary Assembly, which brings together members of parliament of then all um, member states. It was 48 before Russia was recently expelled. It's now 47. All member states, parliaments and elected parliamentarians from France, Germany, Italy, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Serbia, come to this assembly four times a year. They elect the judges of the European Court of Human Rights. They elect the general secretary of the Council of Europe. Now, my colleagues and myself were actually working on Azerbaijani civil society. We were working on dissidents, journalists, and youth activists in 2011, when a number of people that we had interviewed started to be arrested. And that's what got us interested in the Council of Europe, because we thought, well, fine, here is a country that is a member of a club of democracies. Uh, we knew Azerbaijan was not a democracy in, the, in any uh, perfect sense, but we thought that, well, if it's a member, this institution will help uh, get some of these people out of prison. Well, this is not what we discovered. What we discovered is a strategy of capture, which we described, and I quote from our report that came out in 2012, as the following. Many deputies, these are the elected parliamentarians from European democracies, are regularly invited to Azerbaijan and generously uh, gifted. At least 30 and 40 of them are invited in a normal year. They are invited to conferences, events, sometimes expensive summer vacations. There are expensive gifts, silk carpets, gold, silver, caviar, and money. Now, we called it caviar diplomacy because that's what some of our sources in the Azerbaijani uh, administration called it themselves. But caviar is the symbol of this. In reality, this was about large sums of money transferred on bank accounts or handed over in envelopes. And we are talking about tens of thousands of euros handed over to individual members of parliament. We published all this in 2012 without being able to give the names of the people who were named to us as being uh, recipients, beneficiaries of this policy. We couldn't name them because it would have exposed our sources. But so what we decided to do was to get others to investigate. We described the policy, you saw our quote, and then we set out what members of parliament did in the assembly that seemed inexplicable. And we said, well, why don't people ask why people behave in certain ways? Uh, we thought that this strategy would evoke a response. The response we got from Baku was uh, amusement. This was a member of the parliamentary assembly at that time, a rich Azerbaijani businessman, wealthy, close to the regime, um, and he, he was laughing. Uh, we know that because some of the emails in which his reaction was described later leaked. 
In 2013, we, we continued to publish. We wrote about the rapporteur in Azerbaijan, a Spanish conservative senator here, Pedro Agramont, receiving a gift from a leading Russian politician, Leonid Slutsky, who's currently negotiating on behalf of President Putin with the Ukrainians in the context of this terrible war. Well, Leonid Slutsky has been an ultra Russian nationalist. He was very close to Pedro Agramont, and this is a connection, Russia, Azerbaijan, and the people that were being corrupted that we came across again and again. So in 2013, we said that Pedro Agramon should resign. He had failed as rapporteur on human rights in Azerbaijan to describe in any way correctly what was happening. Well, he didn't resign. In fact, his career took off. In January 2013, Baku had its biggest triumph in that assembly. In a vote on political prisoners in Azerbaijan, in a resolution that said there should be no new cases, this resolution was defeated by 125 votes in favor of Azerbaijan against 79 votes against. This was a record turnout. Amazing. Why did 125 MPs turn out? Of course, all the Russians. That was easy to explain. But why did 125 MPs from across Europe turn out to vote for a resolution saying there were no political prisoners in Azerbaijan, a resolution prepared by a German MP? Well, the voted consequences right after this, a wave of arrests started. Anna Mamadli, a leading human rights lawyer and election observer who had advised and worked with the Council of Europe, was then arrested and put in prison for a few years. He actually received the Václav Havel Prize of the Council of Europe while he was in prison, but the prize was given by an independent jury. The institution itself did not seem to care. In fact, Azerbaijan went on to chair the institution in 2014. So you had on the one hand human rights uh, commissioner, Niels Muzniak, uh, pointing out that everyone he had talked to in Azerbaijan was now in jail. On the other hand, you had the general secretary proudly announcing that Azerbaijan led a successful chairmanship of that club of democracies. The reaction in the Council of Europe to our reports, and we kept writing and publishing, was silence. In fact, in The Guardian, uh, Torbjörn Jagland, who was the general secretary of the institution, a former Norwegian prime minister, and the chair of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, so not an unimportant person. In an article in The Guardian, Yagan described Azerbaijan in 2014 as a young democracy which needs help. He also said that the Council of Europe was closely following several trials. He didn't say that these trials were a farce, political, and shouldn't happen at all. In fact, behind the scenes, the reaction was even weaker. We kept reporting also on an absurd election monitoring, one election after the other. Uh, where election observers were receiving money, appeared in Azerbaijan and found the elections to be free and fair, while the only professional observers found that these elections were among the worst ever observed. We kept publishing, nothing happened. In 2015, I wrote an article, The End of Shame in the Journal of Democracy, and we described the Council of Europe as Dorian Gray. It had a beautiful face, but in reality, it was losing its soul. It was withering away. It was becoming uh, ever less relevant to the human rights defense in Europe. And in January 2016, that man, Pedro Agramon, that we had called on to resign, was elected without opposition as the president of the parliamentary assembly. Azerbaijan had succeeded. By now, the people that worked and apologized for its human rights violations were in control of all the key positions in the parliamentary assembly and in the Council of Europe. And it could have all ended there. The fact that it didn't was because some Italian prosecutors did their work in Milan. They came across mysterious transfers to the account of one member of the parliamentary assembly, an Italian conservative, who actually uh, had played a key role during that election, during that vote on uh, political prisoners in January 2013. It was an accident that people stumbled across him. He was not one of the people we had described in 2012 because he didn't play a role yet. So a lot of the people we described were never caught. But Luca Volante and his story we described in another report in December 2016, Cover Diplomacy Part Two, The Swamp, where we could quote from documents prosecutors, Italian Milanese prosecutors had seized, where Luca Volante had written to this man, Elkan Suleimanov, member, later member of the Parliamentary Assembly from Azerbaijan. Dear Elkan, thank you for everything. Thanks for discovering your interesting country. Your gifts are very tasty and very precious. With your imagination, you can fill out what that might mean. We also could quote from the prosecutors who actually put together uh, 
the transfers and the timing when Luca Volante received money on his bank account and our reports, which they had read and heard about, and they could piece together the picture that at that very time, when Luca Volante got all this money, strange things were happening where he was in charge. And then these transfers became very clear. A total of two point, almost 2.4 million euros transferred at different times in different tranches to Milan. In an interview with Italian television, uh, Volante, uh, who was faced with the evidence that he couldn't deny, uh, said that he had actually had an agreement for 10 years and he was supposed to receive a million a year, 10 million from Elkan Suleimanov. He didn't even deny that. Luca Volante received that money, but uh, it is very clear that such an amount was hardly for him alone. So who else received money? We still don't know. What we know is from the emails that were seized, and I just quote from one more, where he actually wrote to Elkan Suleimanov, we have named a lot of friends. And then he gives names of different members of the assembly. Luigi Vitali, who is an Italian. Uh, Tadeo Shivinsky, who's a Pole. Robert Hancock, who's British. Robert Walter, who's British. One a liberal, one a conservative. Jordi Chukla, who's a liberal from Spain. And all of them in favor of Pedro, Pedro meaning Agramonte. In January 2017, after our report was published, Pedro Agramont was re-elected president of PACE. This was extraordinary. I was in Strasbourg at the time. I couldn't believe it. And after he was re-elected, in the evening, I met with a number of MPs who were as outraged by this as we were. This is a picture we took at that time. We met in one of the Strasbourg restaurants and said something needs to be done. And uh, we decided to create a network of accountability to argue to push that Pedro Agramont could not possibly remain president of the parliamentary assembly. And at the very least, there needed to be a serious investigation of what Italian prosecutors had already discovered. This was a cross-party, cross-national coalition, Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, Liberals. And in April, an event was organized where I called in the presence of these other MPs for Pedro Agramont to resign inside the Palace of Europe of the Council of Europe and for a serious investigation. It was not clear that this would actually happen. Media now started to explore the connections and ever more things came out, things that we had in fact already described in our reports over five years. The Belgian connection, where there was a succession of Belgian liberals who worked for Azerbaijan. The German connections, where there was a succession of German conservatives who worked for Azerbaijan. And of course, everywhere and again and again, the connection between Moscow and Baku and Pedro Agramont. In this case, in April 2017, I think it was certainly in spring 2017, Pedro Agramont was taken by a Russian military plane to meet with President Assad in Syria. His guide, Leonid Slutsky, Russian ultranationalist and one of the most influential members in the Russian parliament. In September 2017, the pressure became too high. There was too much investigation. And in the end, Pedro Agramont resigned. The first time in the history of the Parliamentary Assembly, a president resigned. A stellar paced career built uniquely on his support for Azerbaijan came to an end. And yet this remains an almost perfect crime. And I'm coming to the end. We kept writing that Russia, of course, also needed to be investigated. That Russia, in fact, at that moment, when Pedro Agramont resigned, by coincidence, Russia decided to suspend its payments, saying that it would not pay any more its contributions unless the Council of Europe was reshaped and it should become harder to punish any delegation. We said that this was nego negotiating with a pointed gun. The Council of Europe should not give in to Russian blackmail. It did. In 2021, the issue came up again when German prosecutors started investigating. Finally, many years later, some of the German MPs for allegedly having taken money from Azerbaijan. Um, this became an issue in the German election campaign. There was suddenly a lot more interest in the media. This is key. Without media attention, these issues don't go anywhere. And of course, just a few weeks ago, Russia was finally expelled. It wasn't its work to undermine the institution. It was the atrocities it committed in Ukraine. But this creates an opportunity, and I'm coming to the last slide. Lessons and suggestions. What is needed now is another investigation of what has actually happened. Because so far, most of the people who received money over more than 15 years got away with it. 
And Azerbaijan got away with not cooperating at all with the investigation. He just refused to answer any questions. This cannot stand. So we call on the Committee of Ministers, which is the government's, to do a serious new investigation of what happened. We need a new initiative for Europe without political prisoners. It's unacceptable that members of the Council of Europe have political prisoners. We also need a lesson for the Council of Europe in general. Speak truth to power. Azerbaijan is no young democracy. There is no point having a club of democracies when then it serves to whitewash autocracy and human rights repression. And finally, the vision for the institution. It must be a defender of values, not a platform for democracies and autocracies to exchange pleasantries. But the biggest lesson of all is how easy it is to corrupt members of elected parliaments, how weak the mechanisms are to defend our ourselves, and how easy it is, even if this comes out because of the work of prosecutors, civil society, and media, how easy it is for those who've taken money to get away scotch free. All of our reports, newsletters, and more than 25 publications since 2012 you find on this website, and I look forward to the debate. Thank you, Michelle, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Hug up. Um, I mean, thank you. This is a great panel. I'm so happy to be here with everyone today. Um, Gerald, it's tough following in your footsteps, given not only your work in this space, but how much you have led. Uh, and I would certainly highly recommend everyone go to ESI's website and read through those remarkable reports because it's, um, you know, as, as some folks may be aware, the topic of Azerbaijan's caviar diplomacy is one that is uh, it's near and dear to my heart. And actually, Gerald, I have you to thank in part for leading me on this path. I was a graduate school, at, I was a, a graduate student at Columbia not long ago, uh, and ended up focusing much of my research on Azerbaijan's caviar diplomacy primarily in the US, looking at these different entry points in universities, in think tanks, among politicians, among lobbyists and PR agencies, all of these American equivalents, American counterparts, to what you just laid out on the European side of things, and how they end up whitewashing Azerbaijan's uh, uh, image for Western and especially American audiences, uh, and who helps them cover up the regime's crimes and kleptocracy. I will say at the outset, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so unfortunately, Everyone's stuck looking at my face, so I apologize in advance. Now, there's a whole range of topics and industries we can talk about when it comes to how Azerbaijan manipulates Western audiences and how it, how it whitewashes things like the Aliyev family's again, crimes and kleptocracy. And again, I'm sure we'll go into far further detail about so much of that today. Um, but you know, in order to highlight the, the breadth and the range of all of these whitewashing efforts and how so many... Western industries and individuals and, and networks have acted as effective enablers for Azerbaijan's truly brutal dictatorship. I think, heck up, the term you used earlier was totalitarian. I think that's perfectly fair to ascribe to this regime. Um, I actually wanted to run through a pair of stories on the U.S. side of things. It might be, I hesitate to use the word fun because, again, this is such a depressing topic, but maybe bring a little bit more levity to uh, this topic rather than just running through a laundry list of things on, on my end. So these are a couple of stories that I just wanted to share from my end of um, you know having covered Azerbaijan's caviar diplomacy on the U.S. Uh, side of things for the past few years, um, for the better part of a decade. Now, the, the first story I wanted to share was actually back in the early 2010s. Um, I was working as a, uh, a reporter in um, uh, the city of Houston, down in Texas. Now, some of you may be aware that Houston and Baku are actually sister cities um, because of the oil connection. And while I was there, I was actually doing a story uh, on that. And I, I'd gotten to know a, um, a lobbyist who was working for the Azerbaijani regime uh, down there. And I remember one day she and I were talking and she came up to me and she asked if I'd like to fly to Azerbaijan to cover a, um, a U U.S. congressional delegation uh, that was going to be visiting the country, going to be visiting Baku and then traveling around Azerbaijan. It was actually going to be the biggest single congressional visit to the Caucasus ever from, from the Americans, from the American side of things. It was going to be over a dozen different members of Congress who were all going to be flying to Baku all at, all at once. I mean, again, this was the biggest single, I think as one person called it, star, star power you know, congressional visit to the caucuses ever. Um, I was obviously interested, uh, not least because, again, it was going to be the biggest ever. But then I remember the lobbyist said something in particular. She told me 
that uh, they would fly me over. They would pay all of my expenses. They would pay for the flight, pay for the hotel, pay for all the food. Um, and they'd be happy to do that. I wouldn't have to spend a dime. There was only one request that she had. Uh, and that request was that I don't write anything negative about Azerbaijan. I don't write anything negative about the Aliyev family. She said, you know, I remember this. She said, you know, some people just want to write negative things about Azerbaijan, and we want to make sure you wouldn't do that. Um, Rasmus, as I'm sure you're going to be talking about, as I'm sure folks are aware, journalists, you know, that's not exactly something we can agree to ahead of time. The, the term for that is propaganda. Uh, and so I had to politely decline that offer. And I, um, I'm not going to lie, I do regret not going on that trip, not because it would have been taking money from the Aliyev family itself and acting as effective propagandists for the regime, but because, as it turns out, it wasn't just the biggest congressional trip to the caucuses. It was also one of the most scandalous trips of in the entire congressional history. This was one of the most scandal-laden foreign trips American uh, Congress people have ever taken. Because it turns out, you know, when, when they flew over to Baku, they were you know, they wined and dined. It was a very lavish trip. They ended up coming home with some of the gifts. I think Gerald, you, you mentioned they got all these very gaudy crystal tea sets. They got um, DVDs praising Aliyev. I haven't watched these DVDs, but I've certainly heard enough about them that I don't think I need to watch them anytime soon. But it, but it turns out that the nonprofit that claimed that was funding this trip, claimed that was funding all of this congressional travel to Baku, it turns out that wasn't the nonprofit funding it, actually. In reality, it was Sokar that was secretly bankrolling this trip. This was the uh, uh, Azerbaijani state-run oil firm that was the secret financier behind flying all of these American congresspeople over to Baku. Now, when this came out, again, it was a huge scandal. It involved the Office of Congressional Ethics, the House Ethics Committee, and there was this long investigation looking specifically how Azerbaijan had used this fake nonprofit to hide all of this funding from Sokar. I mean, it was a real case study in how financial secrecy truly helps these horrific regimes affect American policy, because it wasn't just that they visited. After they came back to Washington, some of these Congress people ended up praising Baku, praising the Aliyevs in Washington, in Congress, saying that Azerbaijan is a key security ally, a key energy partner for the Americans, and we should always keep it so. And again, this is this is only one trip that we know about. This is only one scandal that we know about. So I do regret not going, not because I could have gotten a DVD about Ilham Aliyev, but because, again, this is one of the most scandalous trips in American history. So that's the first story I wanted to share. The second story I wanted to share takes place a few years later, when I was actually a graduate school, uh, in graduate school at um, uh, at Columbia, when I was actually specifically researching how Azerbaijan uses uh, Western again enablers, individuals, uh, organizations, financial secrecy networks to um, spin its message, whitewash its message, whitewash the regime in particular, and beyond that, hide financial networks. And um, you know, one of the great things about obviously being at Columbia, which I got, I'm sure it's still the case at Harvard as well, is you have all these great voices coming to speak. I don't know about myself, but certainly those who are far more qualified than myself coming to speak, you know, day in, day out, you're exposed to all of these different positions, all these different experts. And I remember one day when I was there, um, I remember seeing that there was going to be a woman who was coming to talk who was affiliated with uh, Georgetown. She was affiliated with the Atlanta Council. She was actually formerly affiliated with Harvard in the 2000s. Um, the name some of you may be familiar with, it's a woman named Brenda Schaefer. Um, who, if you've heard of her, the affiliation you've probably heard is that a few years ago, she was outed. Uh, there was a series of articles on how she had secretly been working as an advisor for strategic affairs for SOCAR. She was posing as this expert on caucuses, energy security, on certainly on Azerbaijan itself, but it just so happened that she was also working directly for SOCAR itself. And again, this was, a, this was actually a pretty big scandal in and of itself at the time because she had also written a series of articles in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, pushing pro-Azerbaijan messaging. And it was the very first time, actually, that when this news about her secret consultancy, her secret um, advisory position came out, that both the New York Times and the Washington Post had to issue simultaneous corrections, public corrections, for the same person. Again, I'm not familiar with this ever happening before. I haven't seen this ever happen since. This was what this was again for one think tank slash academic figure who was secretly working on behalf of the regime in Azerbaijan, or I should say, on behalf of Sokar, which 
again, I'm sure we don't have to detail the relationship between Sokar and the Aliyahs. But um, anyway, she came to Columbia. I was in the audience. I asked her about the corrections because I did. I wanted to know what her, her reactions were to these, these corrections. Again, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the two biggest publications in the U.S. And, um, and she had this great response. Instead of talking about Azerbaijan or if she had any regrets about not disclosing this relationship, I, you know, I was sitting in the audience. There she was. This is when we were doing in-person panels back in the old days. She, um, she instead started asking me what my cholesterol count was and what my wife's name was and who paid my tuition. So she, again, she's just sitting up at this panel at Columbia who's talking about this, asking me what my cholesterol count was. And I'll, I, I still don't know what my cholesterol count is. I had a grilled cheese sandwich for lunch today, which probably didn't help. But it was clear she did not want to answer the question about her relationship with Baku, that she didn't want to talk about why she didn't disclose that relationship, why she thought not disclosing that might work for her benefit or might actually help some of the articles that she'd written pushing pro-Azerbaijan policy reach broader audiences. Um, turns out she also did this in Congress as well. Um, so anyways, these are kind of two snapshot stories that I just wanted to share at the outset to, again, maybe uh, bring a little bit of levity to an otherwise very depressing topic. Um, from my own experience that shows how Azerbaijan truly spins its image in the U.S. and for especially American audiences and who they use to do so. Because even in just those two stories, you know, we have all the different ingredients that I know we'll be talking about today. You've got the lobbyists and the PR professionals. You've got nonprofits and financial secrecy. You've got academics and think tankers. And you've got targets in the media and in Congress and as well in universities. You've got this entire range of entry points of people working on behalf of, again, one of the most truly horrific regimes on the planet. And all of this, I will say, remains perfectly legal. I mean, these people didn't commit, by and large, any crimes uh, in the US. And it's still completely understudied, which is why conversations like the ones we're having today are so important. So I'll, um, I'll stop there. I think I've gone over my 10 minutes. Already, I, I just want to flag one last thing, Hagap, which we were talking about before. Just a few months ago, uh, the FBI raided the home of yet another sitting congressman from the state of Texas, uh, a gentleman named Henry Queller, because of his links to Azerbaijan. We're still waiting for the details of this investigation to come out, come out, but um, certainly on the U.S. side of things, this caviar diplomacy has absolutely continued. It has not stopped uh, at all. Thank you for that, brothers. Okay, so thank you, Casey, and thank you, Gerald. It was very, um, I'm very honored to be here. It's um, uh, it's the first time I'm sitting in a panel actually talking about the caviar diplomacy. It's it's quite lonely to be in Sweden and uh, write articles about it, and um, I think it's because you know we're not getting that much attention to the questions. Maybe it's because we're, uh, the Azerbaijani question is not very big in Sweden. Maybe it's because uh, we don't have a big media climate. I don't know. Um, I usually say it's easier to talk about the caviar diplomacy, to the corruption, than the actual conflict that which I have been focusing on primarily. So. Uh, uh, my entry to caviar diplomacy comes from my work in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, this breakaway region in Azerbaijan uh, where Armenians live. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, I visited Georgia uh, and I visited the border to Azerbaijan to uh, investigate the gas pipelines. I'm interested in new gas pipelines that runs from Azerbaijan through Georgia to Turkey and to Europe. Um, this, uh, the question I ask is what happens when we're actually closing down the gas pipelines from, uh, from Russia into, in, into Europe and where are we going to buy the gas from? And, the, and one, of the, one of the answers to that question is from Azerbaijan. So what we can see is that it's very connected, you know, that uh, Casey is talking about the oil and the gas, Gerald is talking about the oil and the gas, and I am also talking about the oil and the gas in the end. I mean, it's something there, you know, and, um, um, and, and we get back to that. But let me talk a bit about my personal story first before we, uh, I'm going to talk about that. So I was, uh, the first time I was in Nagorno-Karabakh was in 2016 after the war. 
uh, the first four day war. I went with my girlfriend from Azerbaijan to Georgia to Armenia and then inside Nagorno Karabakh uh, just a few months after the war. The second time was a year later, and then I've been going back every year since then until last year. 2020, there was the war which changed things, as, as most of you know that are here at the moment. Um, after the war, they closed the border. Uh, and the Russian peacekeepers are maintaining the only way to get into uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And they closed the borders for Western journalists. But I'm actually one of the few people who uh, made it inside. That's what my book is about, which I'm publishing next, next month. And when I got back from, uh, from the trip, I started publishing articles. I started writing my book. Uh, I was writing about football, actually. <laughs> that was my main topic. And... Uh, Shortly after that, I was approached by the new ambas ambassador from Azerbaijan in Sweden, and he said, okay, Rasta, so I think that uh, we need to talk a bit about your reporting. It's not balanced. It's not balanced enough. Uh, and I explained to him, okay, so let's make it more balanced. I want to go to Azerbaijan, but I'm blacklisted because I've been to, um, I've been to Nagorno-Karabakh. And he offered me a deal. Um, he offered me to sign a letter of pardon where I was going to uh, to explain that I uh, that I ratified the territorial integ integrity of Azerbaijan, and I told him, okay, so let's uh, let's think about that. Uh, I will get back to you after my vacations and uh, and uh, see what we can do. At the same time, he uh, he said, okay, so we can also organize a trip for you uh, to the new conquered areas in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, what happened is that simultaneously I was contacted by a Swedish Azerbaijani organization and the, uh, the chairman of the organization, he said about the same. He said, okay, so I want to organize a project and we want to invite you to write about the conflict from Azerbaijan. Um, it, and I started talking to him and I, we had a few phone calls and uh, it turned out that he wanted to buy me the whole trip as, the, as in the same case as with Casey and the other people. Um, I just told him, okay, so there's a, we have a bit, bit of a problem on blacklisted in Azerbaijan. At the same time, I declined the letter from the uh, ambassador of, uh, by principle, I don't think that uh, I should um, uh, sign a letter which, uh, uh, where he, he shouldn't force me to sign, su sign such letters from a journalistic point of view. Um, so uh, they got back to me, uh, the organization got back to me and they told me that, okay, the trip is canceled, there's COVID, we, were not, we will not send any people. A few weeks later, a journalist called me and he said, okay, so Rasmus, I've been on this trip. <laughs> uh, they told me I should, uh, I, we were going to stay at a three-star hotel. It turned out that we were getting suites at the uh, Hotel Hilton, Hilton Hotel in the, in the, in the center. Uh, so we made a story together. Uh, I interviewed him and I told my story in blind spot. Just one week after the, we published this story, there was another trip from Sweden with another six journalists going. They didn't read my story before. <laughs> so um, I ran the story about these journalists. The, the problem was that one of the journalists, she was the chairman of a press ethics club in Sweden. Um, and uh, the story got quite viral because of this, of course. Um, at the same time, the harassments, they started. So since I said no to the ambassador, I, uh, I started getting harassments from uh, regime representatives uh, in, um, in Azerbaijan. They were not happy about the, about the stories, of course. I was called a media terrorist. I was called, uh, among other things, of course. Um, and I started investigating the um, uh, other people who went on to Azerbaijan on, on uh, similar trips, and uh, I could see there was a uh, there was a systematic behavior from the government in Azerbaijan. Uh, they after the war, they uh, they had a few months where they started restoring the Nagorno-Karabakh areas and they started building roads. When they were finished with this, they started inviting journalists, politicians, bloggers, decision makers, you name it. Um, and they did it on a systematic level. The Swedish journalists were just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and there were 10, 10 people. 
when I was finished with my investigations, I found around 250 to 270 names who went in the period from June until December. Uh, this is not published yet, <laughs> uh, this list. Um, so I also asked the question, so what, why do they want to invite journalists to Azerbaijan to do this? And, uh, and I came up with three explanations. So one of them is the internal. Uh, they want legit legitimacy, in, internal legitimacy in Azerbaijan. They want to show to the people, okay, we're inviting journalists to come here and they're actually writing about like Orden in the way in the way that we want it. The other one, the, the other part is the external. Um, and this is quite interesting because I think that uh, we are, Overestimating the financial um, the, the financial benefits. It's also ideological in in, the, in terms of Azerbaijan. We're talking about Nagorno Karabakh. We're talking about that um, about the territorial integrity in Nagorno Karabakh, and the hope is to um, the, the 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 hope from the government is to make the journalists writing in, in, in a good way about Azerbaijan and also writing in such way that it will contribute to the peace process in the way that Azerbaijan wants in the in the in the Nagorno Karabakh war. Okay, so but uh, talking about the financial uh, part of it, it's also very important, of course. I mean, uh, what's happening in Russia at the moment, we are looking at how uh, on the sanctions. Uh, in Russia, we are looking at the, uh, how how the world uh, how the world is reacting towards um, towards Russia. But we 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 can see the similar events happened in Azerbaijan uh, just a year before. We are looking at a war which is uh, uh, which was devastating for the civilians in Nagorno Karabakh, um, and we can also see that uh, at the moment that just two weeks before the war started, the uh, Secretary General. Uh, of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, he um, uh, uh, he said that um, uh, that they were looking into uh, they were looking positive at the partnership with Azerbaijan to to get uh, to get other ways to get gas into Europe. Um, so this is this brings us back to Georgia, <laughs> where I started my trip uh, this time. Uh, I, I started investigating the. Um, uh, the gas deals between Azerbaijan and Russia. What does it actually mean that we're in, uh, that, that we are importing gas from uh, Azerbaijan into Europe? In terms of um, how does it contribute to Russia as well? Um, so one thing is that Russia has uh, quite um, quite big investments in the gas uh, in the gas plants, and they have quite big investments in the in the gas corridor, which actually leads through Georgia to Turkey to Europe. Uh, and the other thing is that on the 25th of February, the day after um, after the war started in Ukraine, uh, uh, Aliyev and Putin met for to, to sign uh, an alliance agreement. It's not ratified yet by the parliament in in Azerbaijan, but you know it's just a technicality, a formality. Uh, and one of the one of the points in this agreement is that they have a non-competition deal on uh, on energy uh, trades. Uh, with Europe. Um, so this is what I'm looking at the moment. Um, so this is a part, bit part of my story and I have a few other stories as well, but I think we will continue with them later. These have been phenomenal introductions, Casey. I think uh, you can kick off the conversation. Well, actually, yeah, I wanted to pop in, uh, uh, Rasmus, I mean, plenty of things to ask about, but that last point, especially this meeting between Aliyev and Putin, whatever it was two months ago now, Mm -hmm. it didn't get nearly as much attention, I don't think, as it, as it deserved. And I'm glad you, I was going to ask, glad you brought that up. Can you offer any more details about what we know of this proposed alliance? Um, is, it, is it purely security? Is it purely energy related? Are, are, do we have any further information or indication what it's actually going to entail? Uh, it, we have about 50 points um, and they're not very specific, specific. So what we know is that it's more like an intention, uh, I'd say. So, OK, so we have 50 principles that uh, they agreed on. Uh, territorial integrity and whatever, but uh, according to the uh, to the UN to, to the UN law and and so on. Um, so um, we actually don't know much about the operational details. What it actually will lead to yet. So and I hope to get some more information on that. 
So I think we've entered the conversation phase and maybe we'll go around and have a chance for each panelist to respond to the thoughts and the themes raised by the others. If Mr. Knaus, if you have any, any questions or any, anything you'd like to weigh in with. You're still on mute. Thank you. Um, well, I should, I mean, I should say that for us, this, this discovery that I've described, and of course, uh, what has been described by Casey and, and, and Rasmus as a policy that is pursued across uh, many countries, not just in Europe. I mean, we came across it by coincidence. And I, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if uh, a small NGO based in Berlin would not have come across this by coincidence. Um, uh, and if the Italian prosecutors had not by coincidence stumbled across these bank transfers and asked questions, which I'm sure other prosecutors around Europe could have asked, but didn't. Um, so my central point is that it turns out that it's very, very easy to do these things. And it's very, very difficult to describe them in a way that leads to consequences. Uh, I mean, journalists uh, have written um, and, and, and have alerted but as Casey said, a lot of a lot of what we what can be described with the tools of journalism uh, turns out to be uh, morally shocking, politically disturbing, but not illegal. And, uh, what what is different about the prosecutors is they found that there were transfers of money from one member of parliament to another member of parliament before a vote, and uh, in a first instance trial, Luca Volonte and that Azerbaijani in absentia, of course, where sentence this trial first instance is now being challenged, but uh, we will see if it ends up with a sentence. But what, what I think the key point is here is there is an enormous disbalance between the tools of states with all these instruments they have. And a lot of what they do, you know, a lot of states try to have public relations, they pay consultants, they invite journalists and you know, uh, serious journalists I know in Germany by big media, they're very careful about who invites them and who pays. But in the end, this, this is happening. A lot of states do that. Um, but there is this whole other additional illegal activity, which, you know, we don't even know the tip of the iceberg. We have no way to know because unless prosecutors, in the case of Luca Volante, raid his office and find the emails between him and the Azerbaijanis on a memory stick. If that memory stick would not have been in the office, you know, they, they would not know. They could not have proven they, there was, would have been transfers. And, and that is, I think, what is the most worrying for me in this whole story. Because I'm looking at this amazing now in hindsight, you look back and you say, how is it possible that, that Russia got away with so much in recent years? You know, how, how did so many members of, I mean, I'm not talking about backbenchers, we're talking about the former French prime minister, Francois Fillon, uh, former Austrian chancellors of different parties, a former German chancellor, a former Italian prime minister, end up working for Russian energy companies. But I mean, the, and that's the public side, one sees that. What else is happening in the background? How would we even know? Um, I think what this story alerts us to, and this is why I think it's so important that when it comes out, there are consequences. Because if even when we discover something is going wrong and there is a policy by state and it leads to nothing, then my fear is that a lot of the journalism, a lot of, you know, we will have reports, we'll have outrage, but the policies will not end because it's a very, very good investment. And I'm not an expert on the Caucasus. I, I have, we have not written on the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict at all, ever. I mean, we came across this by coincidence because we started working on civil society in Azerbaijan. But what this policy shows us is there are real costs to this corruption. And in this case, the costs that we described was Azerbaijanis who were put in jail um, after the Council of Europe said, everything's fine and basically gave a carte blanche. And this is why I think this is legally, morally, politically, a much bigger scandal than uh, even until now is being acknowledged. And the Russia story, I fear, is also just the tip of the iceberg of influence that was in recent years very successfully manipulating 
politics and public opinion. Uh, if I, I'll just hop in really quick. Everything you said is exactly right. I echo everything that you have uh, have laid out. And I, I think, I mean, there's a couple of responses that I want, I want to, I want to, I guess, just just offer up right now. I think you know, one of the things that's been so effective about your work, ESI's work on this, is highlighting the truly transnational elements of this. This is not one pipeline working against or working with one politician in one country or, or one jurisdiction. This is multi-jurisdictional, multinational, with multiple components working in tandem for the broader strategic goal of whether it's improving Azerbaijan's image uh, abroad, uh, decreasing criticism of domestic crackdowns, increasing reliance on Azeri energy, what have you, all of it for the betterment of the Aliyev regime and the Azerbaijani government writ large. I think and again, this is obviously we, we, we will have to wait to see where things go in, in the future. I think my suspicion is that the comment that you made toward the end regarding the, on the one hand, the lack of knowledge about the depths of this network in and of itself and all of the different entry points, all the different tendrils, as well as the parallels that we have seen to the Russian case study, everything that we've learned about it and all that we still have yet to learn about it, I think is certainly worth I mean, worth echoing on the one hand, but worth keeping in mind moving forward, because I think that we're going to discover there are far more similarities, not just in structure, not just in use and abuse of loopholes and financial secrecy networks and you know everything from the hiring of, of former politicians, European or American, to the actual influence uh, elements on the ground. I think we're going to discover that there are very overwhelmingly similar strategies and tactics between the Azeri case study and the Russian case study. And I, I'm so happy, Joe, that you brought up the figure of Luka Volante, because when I'm not covering Azerbaijan, much of what I write about is Russian interference and influence operations uh, abroad. And one of the things that I cover and do a lot of work on is how uh, Russia and Russian oligarchs have cultivated a broader far right religious right network, this kind of transnational Christian fundamentalist influence network we've seen, especially in the United States of America. And the primary organization they have used to do this, that has received funding from multiple Russian oligarchs, all of whom are now sanctioned, um, is a group called the World Congress of Families. And it just so happens that one of the members of the board, and I was just looking at, at the registration for this just the other day, one of the members of the board for the World Congress of Families is none other than Luca Volante. So when he's not working on behalf of Azerbaijan, just so happens he's working on the board of the primary religious right oligarchic funded Russian American influence operation uh, as well. So again, all of these different building blocks, these overlapping systems, these overlapping elements that aren't confined, whether it's the one influence or uh, uh, interference campaign or the one country, the one jurisdiction moving forward. I think, you know, Gerald, as, as you mentioned, it, um, you know, what would have happened if this one think tank hadn't stumbled across this one influence network? I um, I don't know what would have happened. I'm very fortunate that you did because it's one of those things where you pull on a thread and you realize just how much is out there and just how much remains to actually be discovered. And then beyond that, how many similarities exist to these other autocratic, authoritarian, and increasingly totalitarian regimes, uh, certainly as we're seeing these days in Moscow. Can I just add one more thing because I, I forgot that in the emails that were discovered by Luca, of Luca Volante with the Azerbaijanis, where they talked about how much money he would get and the friends he would recruit, uh, he does refer to the head of the Russian delegation in the parliamentary assembly, uh, Pushkov, who still, I just heard about him today. I mean, he's one of the hardliners around Putin, as is Leonid Slutsky and others. And they discuss how the Azerbaijanis, the Russians, and Luca Volante would meet in Baku. So the point is, if you are bribed or if you are tempted by a prostitute in a hotel in Baku or if you if you take an envelope with money and the Azerbaijanis know about this and they do it over 15 years the Russians will know it too and that means you can be blackmailed for the rest of your political career and then it becomes a security issue yeah. so the fact that nobody seems to be interested in finding out who all these people were who were recruited and paid over all these years by Azerbaijan is deeply troubling. You know, I, I really I really wonder why you know we don't see this as a security risk for international institutions, for national parliaments, uh, for 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 the West, if you want to call it like this, that that people can be blackmailed for decades. Um, and uh, and it's not just Azerbaijan, which some might dismiss as an operetta state, although 
uh, it is really, uh, you know, with all the problems we've described, it's, it's a very serious regime that is really making people suffer. It also gives Russia an influence that as a major power that is now in a new Cold War with Europe, it is really a threat. That connects to the theme I wanted to bring up, which is to what extent is caviar diplomacy really about us in the West? Is it just a, a question of this distant Caspian country? And it's sort of a quaint story how they try to bribe our journalists and how they try to bribe our institutions. But at the end of the day, it's this distant place that doesn't really matter. Or is this really a phenomenon that's about us? Um, I guess, Gerald, you touched on that originally in the Council of Europe. Maybe you'd like to, to begin. I, I think what we've seen in the last 10 years, there was a very good comment by a German writer uh, this week in Der Spiegel, I think, about how we, we might be, I mean, he talked about Europeans, West European, I mean, people in the European Union, citizens and, and elites. He said, we might have been the stupidest generation because we took everything for granted. You know, we inherited these institutions. The Council of Europe was created as a, as a beacon at a very dark time, at the beginning of the last Cold War, you know, when there was a fear that there were Stalinist communist parties very strong in, in, in Italy, in France, when there were still fascist regimes in, in Spain and Portugal, you know, when it wasn't clear how European democracy would work. And the idea was let's create bodies with a European Court of Human Rights that would strengthen these fragile democracies. And then these institutions developed and fortunately democracy spread and Spain became democratic and Greece after a coup returned to democracy and then the, the communism fell in Eastern Europe. And we inherited a Europe that was with more robust institutions, with more human rights bodies, with more democracies than ever. And instead of then retaining the vigilance of realizing that this was historically a uh, Unique, you know, we, were, we never had so many democracies in Europe. We never had so much protection of human rights on this continent. Um, and this wasn't because we were uniquely uh, gifted. It was fought over after a lot of setbacks and horrible experiences, and it needed to be defended. Instead, we just took it all for granted. And a lot of people who went to Strasbourg, I mean, just to take the Council of Europe, you know, they, they just they just stopped fighting. They just stopped, you know, when we discover this scandal from Berlin, do you think the people who are every day in Strasbourg who see this didn't know that something was wrong? I mean, it later turned out when there was an independent investigation, people who worked in the secretariat were, were telling the, invest, the independent panel investigating this scandal after we, we, we called for this in 2017, that yes, there was all these stories about envelopes with money and, you know, Envelopes with money to manipulate election observers. You know, elections are the holy act of democracy. If the election observation missions of big institutions can be bought and people have a suspicion and there's no outcry, you know, this, your, your, your question, this is about us. This is about us becoming so complacent about institutions, about democracy, about safeguards, about, about checks and balances. If the Council of Europe cannot defend the dissidents in Azerbaijan by saying what is happening, just speaking truth to power, uh, how will it defend us when there are new threats to democracy uh, inside our democracies? And, 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 and this article in the Spiegel last week, it, it called us the stupidest generation. You know, it, it hopes we are all waking up in Europe. We're waking up to discover that there are real threats. There are real authoritarians, again, that have a very different vision, that are prepared to destroy a city like Mariupol in four weeks, you know, a city the size of Manchester or, or Toulouse or Dresden, you know, dis destroyed by artillery, uh, four, five million refugees within, within a few weeks. You know, this is serious. And what has kept this from recurring in Europe, what has kept political prisoners and secret police arresting people at night is the fact that we've developed this network of democracies and institutions and we need to preserve it. And so, yes, I hope, and this is why my colleagues and I focused on this so much. You know, we, 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 we were not Azerbaijani experts. Uh, we were not working on the Caucasus with a special focus, although the Caucasus is Europe. You know, we should, we should hold the same standards to institutions, members of the Council of Europe there as everywhere else. Um, 
But we felt this was about the fragility of our institutions in the face of autocracies, which seem to take our institutions more seriously than we do in order to undermine them. They have a strategy. But how many think tanks really wrote about the Council of Europe or wrote about Russian influence in the last few years or wrote about autocracies? And you know, how many journalists were given the leeway by the editors to go into depth you know, on issues where they really need to go into depth to discover things? Um, not enough. So yes, it is about us. I think it's, uh, it raises um, also another question. You know, we are talking about the corruption. We're talking about the uh, systematic um, uh, corruption where we give money to people and uh, gifts and all that. But, we're, but another spectra is also how do they, how do they uh, become a part of the democratic uh, um, institutions in Europe or in, or in America? How, how do they actually act, these, uh, these states, uh, these regimes, like in Azerbaijan? Um, and, uh, and and what we can see uh, actually today or uh, or in this weekend we have a big uh, big conference uh, in uh, in Azerbaijan the World Azerbaijanis Congress uh, which is uh, which is going to happen it happens like every five every fifth year and this is um, this is the highest organ for the diaspora um, uh, for the diaspora organization where they uh, where they gather six, uh, people from 65 different countries and about 400 to 500 attendees who are actually working in the NGOs they are working in 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 different organizations around Europe and they are also becoming a part of the institutions um, we can see that uh, that there is a network within the network let's say that that there is a network, we have a, we have a network of, of, of think tanks in, in the democratic institutions, but we also have a network uh, within this where we can see that the, the people from Azerbaijan, from Kazakhstan, from Tajikistan are, um, uh, are having these networks within, uh, within the European uh, democratic institutions. Um, so this is one of the fields that uh, I think that we, uh, the, 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 with, which measures soft power. Right, so it, it it measures how how um, how uh, if if you have enough people who are groomed in the authoritarian states and working and acting within these democratic institutions, it's also effective. Um, so this is what I'm going to look at next year, hopefully. Stacy, we've covered, I guess, what this means for Europe. What does it mean for the United States? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a great question. You know, the one that you had before that, which we've been talking about for the last few minutes, is is how much of this is a story about us, or how much of this is a reflection of us, as it pertains to the story of Azerbaijan in particular. And and and, and yes, of course, it's all an interconnected web of financial networks, of former politicians, of of policy outcomes, of energy deals, and on and on. And obviously, we in the broader West are intimately connected with all of this. As they say, it takes two to tango. And we have left the door open for years and years and years. But there's, there's an additional element of this, because I know, and I don't, I don't want to bring too many other players into this, but there's almost a sense that I have on my end, and having certainly followed the broader Azerbaijani influence, interference, foreign lobbying campaigns in the U.S. for the better part of a decade now. And I, I think I'm comfortable in saying that Azerbaijan... And again, these financial secrecy networks, this lack of disclosure, this lack of enforcement of basic oversight of rules and policies that were already on the books, let alone that need to be expanded. And again, I'm talking about in the U.S. in particular. If American officials had been paying attention to, had been enforcing, had been pushing back against these funding mechanisms for congressional visits, this lack of disclosure for think tanks, for journalists, for media operations, these broader foreign lobbying regulations that were already on the books. If American officials had paid more attention to it when Azerbaijan was so clearly abusing these loopholes, so clearly barreling right through, again, these doors that we left wide open to upend American policy, to further pro aliyev policies, to further the whitewashing of the Aliyev family and the regime itself. If the U.S. had paid more attention to it, I, I think there's a parallel universe in which all of this, the, the, the far more well-known scandals of influence and interference in the U.S. over the past few years, and I'm thinking in particular of cases like Russia, 
would never have taken place, or at least would have been seen, seen significant pushback, significant less success than they were seeing. You know, the, the phrase that comes to mind is all of these Azeri networks and these Azeri efforts, so much of it looking back, you know, with the, the, the benefit of hindsight, so much of it was kind of the canary in the coal mine for all of these policies that were either not enforced or not in place for all of these threats to democracy, both in Azerbaijan, as well as, frankly, in the United States of America itself. And again, this is going to take years of research. This is going to take years of further documentation, archival you know, openings and all that. I would not be at all surprised if we see what, what uh, actually Gerald mentioned a moment ago, if we see counterparts in Moscow, counterparts in the Kremlin, looking at what Baku was doing and realizing if Azerbaijan can have this much success, why can't we? If they can cultivate, if they can finance, if they can work around the policies, and even then the correct policies aren't actually implemented after the fact, what do we have to worry about? Why shouldn't we try the exact same thing? And I know, again, we're talking about one figure in particular, Luca Volante, who crosses both of those worlds. Um, you have this kind of you know, the, 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 the phrase that other political scientists use is uh, uh, uncivil society, right? This notion of civil society in the post-Cold War world was that countries and, and jurisdictions and democracy promoters would all be learning from themselves. Well, it turns out the autocrats, those pro-autocracy figures and regimes were learning from themselves as well. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if when we finally have access to all the documentation, Azerbaijan is viewed as this kind of innovator in this field of not democracy promotion, but autocracy promotion. Not good governance, uh, liberal democracy, but authoritarian, kleptocratic, and increasingly totalitarian gov uh, governance structures that we thought were years and decades behind us. Anyways, that's that's my kind of theory of the case for why not only Azerbaijan continues to be worth paying attention to at a broadly theoretical level, but why, again, this does have so much to do with us as well on both sides of the Atlantic. So what can we do about all of this? It's been a relatively sobering conversation so far, but we're here because I, I guess, why do you keep fighting? Why do you keep raising the, the alarm about this? Why do you keep discussing it? Is there hope? And if so, what is the hope? Well, if if I look back, I, I, think, I think that uh, the fact that um, it was possible in the end with very limited resources. I mean, we are, we are a small NGO and it wasn't that hard to discover these things. It turns out that's, that's what's so shocking to me in hindsight. Um, but it was possible to, to, in the Council of Europe to discover many of these networks. The trouble is that there was no follow up from the side of public institutions. There are no prosecutors there. You know, people can be shamed. It turns out that there was a whole range of Belgian politicians who uh, registered fake election observation companies at their house, you know, who, who've been pro-Azerbaijani, who went to Azerbaijan to meet President Aliyev and then got themselves elected as the rapporteurs and political prisoners. No political prisoners. You know, this is all public. It, it, it should be shaming, but there was no, no follow-up by... Um, by prosecutors, by you know, was this was this illegal? Where, where politicians bought? The trouble is that the optimistic side is that it's possible to discover these things. The second optimistic side is I think people are beginning to realize this matters. You know, we need robust, credible institutions. If people feel that democratic institutions can be bought um, by autocracies. You know, and I'm not talking about autocracies pushing their argument. This is as bad, but at least if it's open, you, you, you know you, you can respond. I'm talking about buying people, you know, using corrupt methods. Um, if we now realize, and this is perhaps why it is, you know, it is a new Cold War here in Europe. It's very clear. Finland can no longer be neutral. It wants to join NATO. You know, everybody is aware that, you know, NATO needs to strengthen its defenses. And it's not just about military defense. It's about discovering that our institutions need to be defended and that corruption and what Casey referred to, this whole network of non-disclosed financial flows. Why was it possible to use banks in the Baltic states and then companies in the Marshall Islands to pay Luca Volante? Uh, you know, this whole network of, of non-disclosure 
that this is actually a risk to our democracies. And this awareness exists, I think, now. So this is the moment to push for more. Uh, Russia is expelled from the Council of Europe. I think this is a chance to turn the Council of Europe into a beacon of democracy again, which means also pushing you know, for the release of political prisoners, for the uh, release of, of, of prisoners of war, for the uh, respect for basic human rights, and to stop losing this fear that if you push too hard, countries might leave. Well, yes, then they leave. But the point of these institutions is that ideally countries stay and change. The point is not that countries stay and don't change, right? Um, so we have a chance now. This 2022, with this horrible, horrific war in Ukraine and this new confrontation, this new Cold War in Europe, is also clarifying what the stakes are. And what we've discovered is that if prosecutors, and that's why I call for continued investigation of cover diplomacy, if prosecutors in Spain and France and elsewhere go back and look into, into this, uh, and are more alert for future influence of this kind by other big autocracies. It's not just Russia. There are others that I could think of that are also creating university institutions throughout the Western world that they fund to suppress freedom of debate on their systems. That with this new awareness, it's possible to react. So um, media, uh, think tanks, NGOs, uh, courageous politicians, like in the parliamentary assembly, those who pushed for uh, Pedro Agramo to resign across party lines, taking some risks, uh, they can have an impact. And that is an invigorating message, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hop in really quick, uh, Hagop. I mean, the, the short answer, and I, I have been accused of being too optimistic in the past, but I, I'm happy to continue that optimism moving forward because these days it seems like optimism can be all that, all that we have. But I, I, I am optimistic for all the reasons that Gerald just laid out for all the ways that the world has changed over the past few months and this new era that we are now in I, I am optimistic about the kinds of policy responses about the kind of political courageousness or bravery and about again rekindling or re-understanding or re-establishing the broader democratic bona fides of the west itself um you know in in the u.s it's been for many reasons, an absolutely fascinating few years, very interesting few years, um, both in terms of the broader geopolitical context, but especially the, dem the, the domestic context, political context it itself. One of the elements that I am optimistic about where things may be going moving forward is because the U.S. has actually made significant progress, both on the financial transparency side of things, but also as it pertains to highlighting, understanding, and then even beyond that, prosecuting these foreign influence, foreign interference campaigns. And again, I'm not talking about just Azerbaijan itself, but the broader world of and resourcing within um, you know, things like the Department of Justice, these high level prosecutions, and again, the broader societal awareness of the potential threats. I mean, again, this was, we're still in the middle of it, but the past few years have been a very significant stress test for American democracy and then beyond that concerns about foreign influence campaigns. And, and I, it's too early to tell, but I also wouldn't be surprised if we look back at especially the 2010s, less so the 2020s, the 2010s especially is the kind of golden age of Azerbaijan's influence campaigns because so many more, at least Americans, are paying attention to this, prosecuting this, investigating this, certainly being concerned about this. Again, not because it was Azerbaijan, but primarily because it was Russia, but that has the trickle-down effects of all of this. And I, I will say, just as a final point, in um, you know on, on on the influence and lobbying campaign side of things, and again, this is in the U.S. in particular. In in 1938, uh, the U.S. passed the very first piece of foreign lobbying regulations. Um, in in certainly in the U.S. as far as I'm aware, in, in world history as well. Uh, this was called the Foreign Agents. Registration Act. Now, this was supposed to force foreign lobbyists to disclose who they're working for, what they're doing, how much they're being paid, where they're putting their money, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't enforced for decades, really until the middle of the last decade. And again, so much of that because of, of Russia itself. But the reason that I bring that up is because the, the legislation was first passed with this idea, and it's very, in America, it's a very antiquated idea. Actually, Gerald, it's a term you just used, shame. This idea that we can shame American politicians or American PR representatives or American law firms that are working for these horrific regimes. And we've seen 
for decades, that, that idea of shaming them did not work, at least in the U.S. We still had representatives and lobbyists, obviously, for Azerbaijan. Until two years ago, in 2020, when the war broke out, and we saw this incredible public organizing, public protest, especially from the uh, Armenian-American community, highlighting and pressuring the PR firms and the law firms working for Azerbaijan, publicly shaming them. And again, I, um, I am not familiar with any other context, any other example in which American PR firms, which are very cynical organizations, were successfully publicly shamed to end their contracts. And again, multiple PR firms ended their contracts with Azerbaijan. Now, not all of them did. Some of them are still more shameless. But the fact that this idea of shame and public pushback, public protest, public organizing can actually work was one more reason for me to be optimistic moving forward. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Rasmus, would you like to close us out? Well, actually, I think you, uh, you guys said quite a lot. So let's move on to the next question. Well, I think we are just about at the end of our time. So if there is a last point any of our panelists would like to make, you're welcome to do that. But I've, I've really appreciated your time, your commitment to raising awareness about this, and ultimately your optimistic and invigorating messages for us moving forward. I think we all come out of this much more aware of what we need to do uh, to stop these nefarious influence campaigns and save the soul of our democracies. So are there any last comments from our panelists? In this yeah. case, I have. <laughs> okay, so in the end, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and I'm a conflict journalist um, uh, from, from the start. And what we can see, um, we have a, all of this, what we're doing is also to protect the civilian lives in, in wars. So, I mean, it's, it's very important. We, we must not forget, you know, that we, we look at these corruption systems, we look at all these things, but in the end, it's, it's, affecting, um, it's affecting people in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and in other war zones that are affected by these states, of course. So, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's very important to keep that micro perspective in all this. Uh just one final comment. Obviously, Hagab, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, Rasmus, one final question to you. I hear you have a, a book coming out sometime soon. Um, what's the name of the book and when is it out and where can people buy a copy of that book? It will be in Swedish uh, to begin oh. with, but we will translate it. But it's, uh, I, I die slowly every day. It's, it's from a quote in Nagorno Karabakh. I guess that closes us out for today. Uh, it's the first conversation that we've had in a while about this at Harvard, but I think it's the first of an increasing series of conversations about how our democracies are under attack from foreign regimes and how we can actually do something about it. So thank you all for your time and we will see you at the next conversation. Thanks everyone.